Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much, Don, for those kind words of introduction, and thanks for the opportunity, Don and, and Drew, and of course, Jack, uh, to be able to present here at the Ocean GIS Forum. Uh, always a pleasure. I am an ecosystems geographer and content developer at USGS, and that means I have the, the great good fortune of being able to map uh, global ecosystems and have been doing that in a very strong collaboration with, with uh, Esri, and it's just been wonderful, and I'm here to show you some of the, the fruits, the recent fruits of, of that work. Uh, we are in Japan, and if you, if you See, here's Kyoto, I was just there last week, and here's Hiroshima, and this happens to be the big island of Japan, Honshu, if you didn't, if you didn't know that, uh, and there is its area and its coastline length, and it happens to be attached to the Amur uh, tectonic plate. Uh, and how did we know that? Well, we have this new um, app, we have great new data and a new app that lets you explore uh, hundreds of thousands of, of global islands because, sure, there's lots of data sets that would tell you that that's Honshu, but are there any data sets or even da or, or data on all these numerous small islands with the green outlines? Or how about these little tiny islets with these uh, red, red coastlines? Well, yes, there, we, we do have the data now, and we have a new app, and I'll be getting to that uh, shortly. Uh, just to back up a little bit as, as the context for all of this, uh, I am working on a task to develop standardized, robust, and practical global ecosystems and maps for terrestrial freshwater and, and marine environments. Uh, that is under a commission from the Group on Earth Observations. They are a consortium of some 200 nations now that are seeking to advance the use of Earth observation for uh, societal benefit. And so the U.S. is the responsible member nation, and USGS is the agency in charge of that. And I am working very closely with ESRI, uh, and here I say engaged in producing and hosting the content, but we all know it's a lot more than that. It's bringing the science of where to everything we do in this, in this effort, and I'm very fortunate to be working closely with Don and Sean and Charlie and Kevin and Denise and Keith and Pete Agnello, who's no longer here, but it was great when he was, and we miss him, and actually a host of others, many in this room, uh, on this really important work. And so thank you, all of you, for, for your help. To date, we have produced ecological land units. Uh, we call those ELUs. And then recently we produced the ecological marine units and you've, you've seen some slides about that. Uh, and yes, we did put that work out in the, in the Journal of Oceanography. It's an interesting read. I encourage you to take a look at that. And so we finished the ELUs and here they are. And we finished the EMUs and that's really for the open ocean. And what are they? They are physically and chemically distinct volumetric uh, regions of the, of the ocean. And they're sort of, they're sort of large. They're, the spatial resolution is, is a quarter degree, so that's like 27 kilometers at the equator. So for global open ocean data, it's a pretty fine spatial resolution, but they don't really work along the coastline. They do intersect the coastline, but as we all know, coastal features are more linear and people are everywhere, uh, and it's just a finer scale. So we decided we would have to map ecological coastal units independently from EMUs. Uh, and then after, after ECUs, uh, we will also attempt to map global ecological freshwater units. And then Don mentioned uh, we're just starting to think as well about ecological benthic units, again, because the EMUs are strictly uh, pelagic. But we definitely need to map, and Peter, is, Peter Harris is going to lead this, we need to map the, the seafloor uh, into ecologically meaningful uh, areas. 
So it turns out that one year ago at this very event and happening to fall on Halloween day, we launched the, the ECU effort and we ate a lot of candy and, and anybody who said something absolutely ridiculous had to take the mask and it turned out that I had the mask more than anybody else uh, over those two days, but I, that's okay. I'm a terrestrial ecologist, a green guy, as Jack said earlier. Uh, but we launched the ECU project here in this very building a year ago, and we actually have done quite a lot of really good work at that meeting and since that meeting. Uh, and so a year later, we've just put out this paper that broke on uh, October 17th, a new 30-meter re resolution global shoreline vector and associated global islands database uh, for the development of standardized ecological coastal units. So we, we are mapping ecological coastal units, but along the way, we, need, we must have a, a shoreline uh, as the spatial backbone or framework for the ECU project. And a number of these folks are, are in the room. There's a lot of ESRI staff and a lot of some of the, the best uh, international experts on coastal ecosystems. So that's another interesting paper. I, I encourage you to take a look at that. But again, to start with, we needed a good global shoreline vector as the spatial skeleton. Uh, more on that Halloween theme. Uh, and we looked around at the candidates that were available to us, and there are proprietary, proprietary resources uh, which were expensive, and we probably couldn't share them out uh, after we worked with them. And there, there, was, there are resources in the public domain, and there's new citizen science provided, uh, OpenStreetMap shorelines. But we just thought about it, and we decided we, we, need, we need to build our own new, relatively new, uh, standardized global shoreline resource. And so we did that. We went up into the cloud and we used 2014, oh, I'm sorry. We used 2014 annual composite Landsat imagery. And using annual composites is, is good because it sort of dilutes out the, the cloud effect, which is, which is why you use uh, composites. So we extracted this new global shoreline vector at 30 meters, and we intend to now sort of quantitatively, using statistical clustering, uh, segment that, that global shoreline vector into a number of uh, environmentally distinct and ecologically meaningful uh, areas that we will call ECUs. So we got our GSV shoreline vector as the framework to begin with. And then it occurred to us, because we didn't go into this seeking to make a new global islands database, but it, it occurred to us that by the mere application of polygon topology to that global shoreline vector, uh, we would be sitting on a, a new global islands data set. And so we did that, and we have a new global islands data set for all of you. And we decided to uh, to group islands into three size classes, the five continental mainlands, the Americas, separated at that canal, uh, Africa and Eurasia, separated at that canal, and Australia, so five continental mainlands in tan. And then big islands, which appear here as blue, was any island greater than one square kilometer. And that's actually pretty small, one square kilometer. But anything greater than one square kilometer, we call it Big Island. And then anything smaller than a square kilometer um, is, a, is what we call a small island. And those appear here as red. And actually, you would never be able to see them at this zoom level because they're so small. So we just exaggerated the, the color and the size so that you would be able to see those. And this is a table out of the paper. Uh, there are our five mainlands. And we also found <laughs> mapped. Uh, some 22,000 of these big islands greater than a kilometer squared, and nearly 320,000 of these small islands, many of which are just rocky outcrops out there uh, off the coast. 
Uh, so what does it look like? This is a little archipelago on the extreme west end of the Florida Keys. And our global shoreline vector is the red. And the yellow, the yellow polygons are the global, self-organizing, high-resolution, hierarchical shoreline. The GSHHS. Maybe the first time I've ever been able to reproduce that correctly. And I, might, I'm, I may have flipped the two H's. Uh, at any rate, you can see that the GSHHS has sort of a, a shift here, and it just doesn't, didn't seem to hug the, the landmass as, as you would want. Uh, but that GSHHS is really a fantastic resource. It's been the standard Global Islands data set. Uh, it's been around for years. People have used it. It was digitized from uh, navigational charts. Uh, but we felt that there is room for improvement, and we see that improvement uh, with the global shoreline vector, which really hugs the, the terrestrial landmass. So we have this new data on global shorelines and global islands, uh, but data and maps are never enough, as has been the point of the last couple of presentations. We really need apps, so-called killer apps, to actually expose the data to the broadest uh, possible audiences and just make it very easy for them to, to use the data. So this is a very simple app, and uh, it's, it may, maybe is even elegant in its simplicity. This app is called the Global Island Explorer. Uh, there, sorry again, there are the, the collaborating logos, and then this is also work associated with MBON, the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network, and the GEO Blue Planet uh, Initiative, two initiatives of GEO. And so you go to the tool, this is the entry page, <coughs> excuse me, you click the tool to enter the map, and you arrive at this <coughs> global view, and, and now the, the big islands are, are solid fill green, and the little islands uh, are solid fill orange, and you wouldn't be able to see them. So as in all these viewers, you, you zoom in. It's really just an online uh, visualization and, and query tool. And so we have zoomed in to the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean. And if you click on the legend, it tells you what you're looking at. Again, big and small islands. And then, of course, if you click any island anywhere on the planet, then what returns is the information of the name and if it, what size class it's in, some of the area and coastline data, and then, again, the tectonic plate that it's attached to. And actually, we, you know, we're interested in that in and of itself, what's its tectonic connection. But it also happens to be a very clever way to avoid the, the geopolitics of international ownership of island territories, which can be... Uh, Quite, quite complicated. Think, think of the Falkland Islands, for example. So we, we include the tectonic plate. And so we've zoomed in a little bit further now on the same island. This is the Dominican Republic side of, of Hispaniola. And, uh, and now if you click the legend, uh, we're, as you get into a certain level, the solid shading drops out because we actually do want to see the, the shoreline vector so now the shoreline is, for big islands, is lime green, and for small islands is, is orange. And I'm trying to get to this island here, Isla Sauna, because I, I know it very well. I did a rapid ecological assessment there when I was working for the Nature Conservancy. So I could just zoom in, because it's got the classic pan and zoom functionality, but since I know its name, I can type it into the, the search finder. <clears throat> and so I type in Isla Saona, and it, it takes you right there. And then because we're using the sort of Esri templates for, for these viewers, which are so wonderful, it means that we have just a, a number of different backdrop choices for displaying your data over. And in this case, I've chosen the, the world image base map so we can look at the, the, the hug, the fit of the coastline to, to the landmass. 
and it looks pretty good there, and we're pretty far zoomed in now. We're, we're better than one to 100,000. Uh, and this is Isla Sauna, and this is the peninsula. And it turns out there's a little island in between there uh, that we found. The algorithm found it, and we got a name for it, and it's Isla Catalanita. And look, that one is only 0.2 <coughs> square kilometers. Uh, and we got it just by querying that polygon. So that's really the essence of the, of the tool. And let's just go to somewhere else in the world, the other side of the world, to New Caledonia. Uh, this is the Isle of Pines. It's a southern island off of the group of islands that constitute New Caledonia. And it happens to be the place where the New Caledonian crested gecko, uh, it, it's endemic to this Isle of Pines and the surrounding islets. That's the key thing that I want you to note here. This is a global data set, but it, it actually has a lot of really great information about little islets, little rocky outcrops that don't, don't often appear in, in uh, other data sets. And so we can now understand better where this New Caledonian gecko is from. And I included that as an example because they're very popular in the pet trade. And we have one at home. We hatched him from an egg. His name is Flash. He's, he's over 10 years old. And his homeland is, in, is endangered because of this over-extraction for the, for the pet trade industry, I imagine, in, in combination with habitat destruction and the, the usual threats. Uh, so we, we are in a better position now to understand and conserve Flash's homeland. Uh, in all of our global ecosystem mapping projects, we have a, a, a mascot, and, and in this case, it's, it's this sand crab. And its genus is Emerita, which I really like. So that's our, that's our mascot. Uh, there's Flash again. And in conclusion, we have some really good new resources for you. Data, a, a paper, and a, a new online visualization and query tool. Uh, the data are already in the public domain. And I'm only a, a day or two away from getting it up into um, the Living Atlas as, as a resource. I just had to figure out how to do that. And uh, another point here was that although it is globally comprehensive data, I think its 30, 30 meter resolution is going to lend itself well to several local scale applications. It's not as good as taking a drone up and mapping an island from super high resolution imagery, but we have mapped a ton of, of these tiny global islets. So we think there's some potential utility for this global data in local applications. And finally, we're going to use all these data, and in the months ahead, we're going to figure out how to uh, stratify these coastal areas into ecologically meaningful uh, ECUs, ecological coastal units. So watch for that. Thank you very much. Thank you.